it's great to be back in the uh, in the Western Cape again. Um, this is my third time here, so um, I am becoming somewhat local. Um, but yeah, at the moment, um, all this talk about rugby, I think I'll, uh, I'll I'll leave it for a bit longer. Okay, um, I'm going to try and cover a little bit different to some of the other guys. We're looking at the management component of uh, achieving high yielding canola. So. Uh, going to give you a little bit of an overview of Western Australian canola production, just so you can understand where it is that I work and, and what I do. Um, and just touch on seed treatment fungicides and probably the key to diseases uh, in black leg and sclerotinia. Um, I had a request to talk about white, white leaf spots, so we will cover that as well. And I know other growers uh, love to spy on what other guys are up to, so I've got just a little bit of a snapshot of one of our better canola growers um, from where I work and I'll, I'll put his whole farm program up so you can take a po picture of that if you like and see what it is he does, that he does well. Okay, so just to touch base firstly on Western Australia, um, we're the major canola growing region in, in Australia in terms of export. Um, so we produce about 40% of the 2.7 million tonnes um, each year. And most of that's exported into Asia and also into that biofuel market that Ferdy spoke about before in the EU. Um, one thing that we do do quite well um, in Western Australia is we, we set definitely farm for top line yield, but we also farm for oil. So for us, we have an oil bonification scheme and for each percentage of oil above 42%, uh, we get about $7 uh, the last couple of seasons, so whatever that is this year. Um, but where that's a factor is when we're applying management tools like fungicides, sometimes it's not just top line yield, sometimes it's quality uh, and that's helping to pay for that management decision. So that's just a quick snapshot there. Um, this year we had intentions that there was going to be a reduction in the canola planted area. Um, but given that canola is a, an excellent rotational tool for us from a herbicide management perspective, but also a rotation for soil borne diseases in cereals. And we had very early rainfall in March and April. We went back into canola in a big way and we put in about 1.16 million hectares in Western Australia this year. As Rob said in his talk, um, it's a bit of an experiment because putting early season varieties into uh, the end of March and early April um, has its own problems. And one of the biggest problems is actually disease management. And we'll cover why that is in a moment. And if you look across these zones here, um, the area that I work is primarily the Geraldton Port Zone um, and uh, into this Quinana West and a little bit of the Quinana East Zone. Um, our best canola production is really in these regions. If you looked at it on average, you know, the northern guys are sort of always targeting somewhere between one to two tonne in this eastern region. Uh, one to one and a half, and then we're in that three ton zone uh, through here. So it does come down to geography. If you purely look at averages, sometimes averages can lie because we've got big hectares of low yielding canola, but that's used as a rotational tool. Whereas here, it's a key profit driver as part of the rotation. So much tighter rotation year on year, and as a result, different disease parameters in the crop. So if we look at the disease uh, parameters, uh, going from some GRDC, which is our national grains uh, body, um, they're looking at some current management losses um, with what we're doing now. So if we look at seed treatments, uh, we look at varietal tolerance, uh, those types of things, this is what we're looking at as losses from blackleg. If we did nothing, that's potentially what we'd be losing um, in terms of hectares and millions of dollars in lost production. Sclerotinia stem rot, uh, I think that's actually a bit higher, this figure, particularly in a year like this. So sclerotinia is one that's not quite as con consistent as blackleg. It's definitely more seasonal as to its impact. So this is data from last year. So this year we'll see much higher um, losses uh, across the country because instead of being in a period of drought, the whole country is in a period of, uh, of good soil moisture this year. Um, and then these secondary diseases, downy mildew and white leaf spot, and we'll cover those. They're certainly much less of an issue, um, but an issue nonetheless. So, talking about canola management, 
Um, obviously with a canola crop we've got everything from that emergence all the way through to flowering so it's quite a broad area to cover. If we're just talking about fungicides, I know you guys use a product called Galmano, uh, we call that Jockey Stayer. So that's just to get our seed out of the ground, good plant establishment and uh, set ourselves up hopefully um, as the first couple of guys have spoken about today in John and Rob, um, how you set that canola up is how you set your potential yield. So that gets us our plant stand. Then we're looking at, in high risk scenarios, tight rotations, those sorts of things, deploying a fungicide management strategy like using Prezaro in a proactive manner. And I'll explain why we need to be proactive, but in that four to six leaf window. Now I know a lot of you guys are growing your TT varieties at the moment, so you're probably putting clethodim or something like that with an atrazine top up in that four to six leaf window. So it still fits um, from a, a timing perspective to other management decisions that you're making on your farm. And then the one that uh, is probably for you guys a bit of a hot topic it seems at the moment is sclerotinia and it's the same for us um, in Australia and it's obviously a little more tailored to this flowering timing and we'll explain a little bit about the life cycle of the, uh, the disease and hopefully there's a couple of pointers that you can take away from some of the work that we've done over the last few years in Oz. So just to go backwards to the seed treatments um, that we're using, uh, you guys are using Galmano, Fluquinconazole, excellent product at getting your plant stand out of the ground. Just those first couple of leaves of protection and then you're no longer getting protection from the fungicide. It's all down to the influence of variety and the genetics um, or if you're deploying a, a, a foliar fungicide strategy like using Prezaro. We also use a product called Intake. We tend to use that a lot more in our lower rainfall region because guys don't want to cart long distances seed to market to be treated and they're tending to use more open pollinated varieties. So they'll either add that to fertilizer or liquid band it. And we have a couple of products which are probably a bit unique compared to what you guys are using, but we have a lot of um, sawborn establishment disease pests like Rhizoctonia, uh, Pythium and Fusarium. So again, these are just products that are enhancing our plant stand and achieving that target number that you saw John talking about, keeping as many of those uh, 30 to 40 plants per square metre in the system. Right, black leg. It's a bit like the English uh, rugby side. We took our eye off the ball a little bit um, in Australia in regards to black leg. We kind of thought we had it beaten. Um, we thought that uh, we had seed treatments, fungicides and varieties. Um, we were ignoring the fact that we'd had a run of dry years and conditions that weren't conducive to black leg. So when you're playing at the wrong time of year and you haven't got your house in order, um, a bit like David Pocock um, this year, we've been beaten up um, by black leg. So in Western Australia, we actually have what a winter is and you speak to uh, some of the old timers, um, they're saying they haven't seen a winter like this since uh, you know, living memory since they were a kid. Um, it started raining in March and it just seems to keep raining. We keep waiting for that tap to turn off. But what that's meaning is black leg is showing its hand like we haven't seen for a while. So it pays to not underestimate your opposition. And uh, if Owen Farrell is kicking for the opposition, he'll certainly kick you. Okay, so black leg, um, stubble borne disease spread by wind. And it's not as windy today as it was when we were on the Southern Cape yesterday, but um, I can guarantee there was spores blowing a very long distance. They may have even been making their way up here. It was blowing that hard. Um, so you can think of black leg management as an area-wide issue. So what your neighbour's doing or your neighbour's neighbour is something that you need to consider. So crop rotation is a good thing, um, but because the spores can travel a long distance, a one in three rotation is not going to be enough to defeat black leg if you've got half a kilometre down the road. Uh, the same genetic type of uh, canola variety that you've been growing um, those spores will be attuned to that uh, genetic resistance and you'll have them falling on your crop, um, potentially causing you more of an issue. So later sowings um, favour spore maturity and disease. So those that don't know how black leg basically works is it's just temperature, moisture and enough of that put together once you get to the right temperatures, um, those stubbles uh, will release the spores showering the crop. So the later that you sow, the higher the probability is that those spores are mature 
and uh, spreading across uh, your valuable canola. So that's where um, variety and resistance group selection is important, but it's not the only part of the puzzle, and we need to use that with all the tools that we have available. So that's using seed treatment or in furrow fungicides, as well as foliar fungicides. So we'll touch on a few of those points. Um, the issue that we've got at the moment is we've got a lot of guys that's just like you like a particular type of beer. It's like, I drink Castle. So I'm sticking with Castle. Um, it's like growing the same variety again and again. Eventually you get a bit of a tolerance uh, to that variety and that's what blackleg can do. So if we have too many of a particular uh, group uh, for resistance grown in an area, blackleg will evolve resistance to that group over time. So it's important to use, as uh, the earlier speakers spoke about, using not only different season lengths, but knowing the different uh, germplasm and the dis different resistance groups in that system to prolong uh, the life of those, uh, those groups. Because if you consider them, they're almost like they're a, another fungicide tool for you. So like anything, you should be rotating herbicides, rotating fungicides, whatever it is. Be diverse as you can and you'll stay ahead of the opposition. Because this is an example of certain things that if we do the same thing over and over again, um, we do see things start to break down. So across southern Australia, um, there's been a, a widespread survey conducted and um, unfortunately, we've seen that uh, we've had some reduction in the efficacy of fluquinconazole or galmano. Uh, this has also meant that other triazoles in the early generation, like the flutriophile that we showed, um, have reduced sensitivity. So if we look at a normal isolate of blackleg and uh, a fungicide tolerant isolate, these percentages of stem canker are very high. When we put the jockey on the seed, this is kind of like the response we expect. It's a good suppression tool in a high risk st strategy, but once we've seen some slippage, we're barely getting any effect. So that's a bit of an issue. And you can see it's spread across uh, much of our southern parts of the regions. You can see where a really high production, high risk, cooler, longer season climate, uh, low tolerance and high tolerance in our great southern through South Australia and coming through in Victoria into New South Wales. So um, that's an issue for us that we need to keep an eye on. We don't quite know how, how that looks yet, but this is new research that's ongoing. What it shows though is if we do the same thing again and again, um, eventually the system breaks down. Because one thing we know is nature will always win and uh, it's important to have a diverse strategy. So keep an eye on it. You don't want an English rugby team turning up in your paddock. So if we're showing uh, using some other, other um, I guess, ways of looking at this, it's like thinking of a, a seed bank. And if you're reducing your disease bank, um, you're reducing the potential spores and pressure on your varieties over time. So this was a trial we did and showing the yield comparison here of a proactive strategy. So if we just use the jockey or the galmano alone, uh, we set up her plant stand nicely, but we had high infection coming in. Where well, we applied Prezaro here as a single spray um, early in the crop, two leaf, four leaf and six leaf, we had a nice yield response. It wasn't to say that we didn't get a yield response applying it later, but we were far better off in terms of yield and return on investment by being proactive with that fungicide. This green bud spray has also added in just a black leg uh, scenario here. Um, it's added a little bit particularly where we've got these more proactive early timings, but spraying late, uh, again, not so much. Probably an issue though is two sprays for black leg when you've got sclerotinia. So I think what you need to take the lessons out here is a single spray uh, for blackleg if that's something that you need to do as a management strategy because of the variety that you may be growing or the scenario that you're in. Um, but the other disease that's causing a lot of grief for our growers and causing issues um, with timings of fungicide, a green bud spray is too early when we target sclerotinia. So we're using uh, four black leg. Um, just a quick one I just wanted to touch on. So I talked earlier about the, uh, the stubble and the maturity of the spores. It's a known um, relationship. 
So there's an excellent model that's been developed by the Department of Agriculture and Food in Western Australia. And something that Bayer has brought to, uh, I guess, growers as a free, um, free management tool is this uh, called the Prezaro scale. And what it does is for your postcode or your local area, I'm not sure what you call it here, zip code, something like that. Um, it models the weather and then looks at uh, the spore maturity date. So if your planting date is coinciding with that, um, your risk factors will increase. Roughly, a later sowing timing will favour blackleg. Uh, like Rob said, early sowing favours sclerotinia. So, um, but it's yeah, just something that we're using to make better uh, management decisions. So sclerotinia, and this is one that I liken to a uh, springbok rolling mall. And if you don't stop it up the field. Um, it gathers momentum and it causes damage um, down the field and, and that's really the issue with sclerotinia. Again, um, I can't reiterate the need to be proactive with applying fungicides for this disease. So we'll cover a few things. Um, different to blackleg, this is not a stubble-borne disease, this is a soil-borne disease. So something that it's important to think about um, is it's, it's more localised than blackleg. So it's about your paddock history and the paddock next to its history and we'll cover some of that um, as to why. Uh, one in three rotation we've shown is, uh, is short because the sclerotia and we'll cover the life cycle in a moment um, can persist far beyond that and uh, as we said we've got a, a statewide experiment this year in Western Australia with early sowing and uh, there's a few cultural things with some right at wider row spacing and lower seeding rates that growers have trialled um, but that's coming at a cost to uh, yield potential. So um, everything has a cost, I guess. And uh, we touched on it being proactive in the approach. Okay, so uh, who's got good eyes and has wandered around their paddocks and uh, seen the start of the cycle within the year? Any hands who's seen the little mushrooms, the little apothecia? So a couple of you. So these little buggers are the ones that start the whole ball rolling within a given year. So they're called apothecia, and they put up uh, from the moment that they unroll, like this little guy here, they're releasing millions of spores into the air. Those spores uh, tend to land up on the petals of the, of the plant, and when they fall back to the plant, they land on there and get trapped uh, on a wet leaf between the petal and the leaf. That's what initiates this infection. So if you have a look closely, you'll see there's a difference between a black leg lesion, which tends to be more irregular, and the little black dots on it, the pycnidia. This looks more like a watermark, like you've thrown a pebble in a pond. Think of it that way. That then moves into this mouldy phase. Um, this is where you're getting your stem rot and, uh, and losing your potential yield through uh, stem breakage and restricting the flow of uh, nutrients and moisture to the, to the pod. Um, if that gets severe enough, you'll see these will rot off uh, before the season is even through. And uh, they leave these little rat poo behind, and they're the sclerotia. And if you think of it, that's like a weed seed. That's what's going into the soil and setting up that soil as having sclerotinia present in the system for the next five to eight years to come. Because each time it rains, um, in the following season, the cycle starts again. So that's a quick overview. Um, so some other quick facts is those sclerotes, as we said, can survive in the soil for long periods. So um, a one in three rotation won't see you beyond the period that, that they can survive. So, uh, so that's an issue. Um, if we're seeing that we're getting other benefits from canola in the system, um, you know, one in three, one in four is something that, that tends, to, tends to fit with. Um, lupins. It, Cape weed or Cape marigold um, and other broadleaf crops are also hosts. And normally we'd stand here and say, you need to have a rotation crop um, for your cereals. Well, cereals are actually a break crop uh, for sclerotinia. So coring um, for once is a break crop for something. Um, one of those single sclerotia can produce up to 15 of those little mushrooms over the course of a season. Um, so they keep, keep coming as long as the conditions are conducive. All varieties are susceptible, and anyone that's seen sclerotinia, take a bow because it means you've learnt how to grow good canola. Because it usually uh, it 
comes in to where we have a, a good fertiliser program and big healthy canopies. You create that nice microclimate for the disease to prosper. The main, main stem infections uh, logically cause greater yield loss than lateral ones. So early preventative sprays are going to preserve more yield um, than waiting late. Um, the other thing, and you guys are, are growing, uh, you know, spring canolas as well. Uh, we're seeing six to eight weeks of flowering, no problem at all, sometimes longer. How do you straddle that when you've only got a fungicide that works for about three weeks in the crop? So we'll cover a bit of that. And a rough rule of thumb, if you don't want to know, go, don't go counting how many stems you've got infected in your paddock, but it'll, uh, it'll tell you roughly the percent potential of yield loss um, is roughly about half a percent per stem that's got infection. Okay, conditions favouring disease development. So the apothecia will emerge when the soil profile hits about 15 degrees and is full of moisture. The 15 degree part thing I think for you guys is similar to Australia. That doesn't matter. It really is now about a full moisture profile. And then within about a week or more, um, you'll see the first apothecia start to emerge and they'll stay out if the canopy, either in the cereal crop that they're emerging in adjacent to your canola or in the canola um, is good enough, they'll stay out and keep producing spores. The critical component for the infection period to take place is leaf wetness. So periods of high rain frequency, not necessarily high rainfall. So wet days, dew days, those types of things are more critical. And 18 hours of leaf wetness will allow that little spore to infect and create that watermark which starts the whole process rolling. And we end up with these ghost plants here at the end. And the optimal temperature for development is above 20 degrees, which just means it moves faster, but it still happens at lower temperatures. I'm not going to go into this too much, but what I wanted you to just to start to think about is we treat sclerotinia now as a little bit of a, of a fire warning scale. So uh, we've got paddocks that are, you know, are red. They're uh, extreme pressure and we're calling them endemic paddocks. So the management strategies for those are pretty simple. If I have an uh, average year to above average year, I'm definitely spraying once and I'm probably spraying twice. Where I haven't got as higher incidence or history, because remembering we said before, this is a more localised paddock to paddock uh, disease than blackleg, which can blow over a whole district. We're expecting we're going to spray once and we're going to try and spray to conditions to get the best of out of our spray and uh, maybe we might have to spray two in a year like this. And these ones here are sort of like the new, the new chums. They're just starting to find it and they're just starting to see uh, infection. And that is then a season like this will be requiring a spray but a season like last year where we had dry conditions they're unlikely to spray. And then we have our eastern wheat belt guys which are now laughing at our western uh, high growing canola guys. And if you looked at the numbers that Ferdy put up about at what the costs are to grow a high yielding canola crop here compared to a low yielding canola crop, the gross margin out the back end doesn't look as different even though it might be three times the yield because of the management that's required. But it's important to use all those management tools correctly. So if you understand the disease, um, that helps and goes a long way. So this is just a quick example of what I would call an endemic paddock or a very high risk paddock. So this is from Ger near Geraldton in Western Australia. And uh, we had a, a rain events come in um, and the first apothecia came out in the early part of July. Pretty significant flower of the crop. They were hard to find, but they were there. Um, within another week, uh, we could find more apothecia emerging, but we could already see leaf infection had started in the canola crop. Another two weeks on, we've now got mouldy leaves. So I've gone from one week to three weeks. If I'm going to make a management decision, when would be my timing? So if you think about that, early signs, um, first bit of leaf infection should be when that's already telling you I need to go. By the time you're getting to mouldy leaves, no fungicide is curative completely. So it's preventative strategy. By the time we got to the end of the month and 50% flower or, or peak bloom, uh, we had significant stem infection throughout the trial. And uh, I'll show you some data from that trial um, in a moment. Okay. Um, now, 
Lots of questions come out about flowering stages and flowering timings. It's important to know the flowering timings because it helps you make a good decision, but what's more critical is knowing the weather conditions and the canopy management uh, that you've got. So it's good to know that 20% bloom is about 14 to 16 flowers open on the main racumen, but that's not the be all and end all. So the label may say spray between 20 to 50%, but as I'll talk about, the, it's more important to spray to the conditions. If I have leaf wetness coming up, is in a rain period for three or four days, or a period of really dry conditions, I'm not gonna spray. But if I can see that I'm gonna have four or five days of leaf wetness, deploy that spray prior to then. Because if you remember what I said about how long the fungicide lasts in the plant, it's a matter of weeks. If you've sprayed it through a period where the leaves are dry, the fungicide's not doing its best work for you. So spray to conditions when you're around this flowering stage. So that's a good guide, the flowering timing to be thinking, but the conditions are as important. And uh, just like with Blackleg, we use a risk management tool um, in Australia, and this high risk zone basically is where the stars are aligning from a sclerotinia perspective. We've got leaves that have been wetter for 18 hours or more, and the temperatures uh, are sitting in the right band. So you can see over the course of, this is June, we had high risk here in June, but for the most part, we had eight leaf plants. So I'm not spraying for sclerotinia. But here, we had flowering plants through the back end of June, and we've been spraying now for about four to five weeks, depending on geography and planting date. So conditions can come in any time, but the microclimate and the crop needs to suit it. And that's where that flowering comes in, if you think of it that way. It's almost telling you that the cabbage is large enough at the bottom as well to support the, the disease. So this is a bit of a range of responses from applying Prezaro for controlling uh, sclerotinia in canola. And these were commercial paddocks um, where we actually had an untreated in 38 uh, trials. So if you look at some of these results here um, at this back end, why did they get that response? Some of it was a super high risk paddock in a very high risk year, and some of it was just perfect timing. And that's why I wanted to pick on this Munyanuka one here, which uh, is called Geraldton times two spray here. That grower, he sprayed once. We had a dry period. He waited. I went ahead and sprayed my trial in the same paddock. I had from the two spray strategy about, I think it was 27% yield response. He waited, he had nearly five weeks in the interval because it was very dry. And then it got wet again at the end of August. He sprayed again and he straddled that last infection event and got a huge response because we actually had three weeks of, of moist weather. So timing is critical. If you look into deeper into some of these results down here, sprayed too late, sprayed too early, those kinds of things when you look into them. So getting the timing right and hitting the sweet spot means you're gonna be maximizing your yield potential. It's, it's not about increasing yield, it's about maintaining your yield potential when you're spraying for sclerotinia. Okay, so just to uh, reiterate a couple of points that we've found this year, um, early sowing dates through April and even late March just equals more disease because you've got the wettest months of the year coinciding with flowering. It does depend on variety a little bit, but at the end of the day, if it's flowering and it's really wet, um, sclerotinia will find a home. Uh, the peak infection events, uh, similar to what we saw in 2014, were occurring about three weeks after we saw the first apothecia, which meant we were about a week late on getting that spray on. If we'd sprayed it in the first week to two weeks, um, we would have seen better results. Um, history, and when I say history, it's adjacency to previous trouble, trouble spots. So what's the paddock next door done? What's the paddock I'm into done in the past? Have I seen sclerotinia in there? That's more critical than my neighbor, uh, you know, five kilometers down the road. Um, what he's got doesn't mean you've got the same, but blackleg can move those kinds of distances. Sclerotinia is sort of half a kilometer um, type thing. Those spores can move. Lupins is a lovely host for sclerotinia. So if you had a canola following lupin, that'd be high risk. Same with Cape Marigold. 
um, excellent hosts. I have a paddock this year. I'm doing a trial in that hadn't seen canola in, in the last 25 years, but it has had a Cape weed clover pasture, and it's getting absolutely owned. Uh, and the geography for us is increasing, mainly because we've got better at growing canola across a wider region. So, um, just to recover and recap, don't apply too early. So we need to know that there's disease in the area, um, either through apothecia or finding early leaf infection. Early leaf infection, still not too late to spray. You can make an excellent management decision and get in then. If you spray once there's some mouldy leaves, it's not saying that you're not gonna get a benefit. It's just saying that you've lost some of the potential benefit already because you may have had five or 10% of your yield already taken before you've sprayed that product. So be proactive. Um, apply to weather conditions and uh, target multiple sprays in high disease or high yield potential years. Um, the other critical thing is, that the, uh, is the water rate. So application, one thing that we do do is, yes, the petals are the part that tends to drive most of the cycle, but you can get two leaves stuck together lower in the canopy forming the same thing. It's just a microclimate where there's moisture, humidity um, around that spore and we can initiate infection. So as a result, when we're spraying, we make sure we've got high water rates and really good pressures because if we target the bottom third of the canopy, it means we're getting excellent coverage to the rest of the canopy. And if we don't get good coverage right through to the bottom third of the canopy, again, we're not getting the best out of our fungicide. So make sure you test and have a look um, at the bottom third, and you're getting really good coverage through there. Uh, look, I won't touch on too much other. Um, with that, I think we've got everything covered. Uh, Aviator X Pro is a product we're looking at. I'm not sure where you're up to in SA. But one thing I wanted to say about was, um, you talked about yield stability, Rob, and this is a guy that does a really good job of this. Um, this is over his whole farm last year, um, and this place is probably, it's not quite uh, pile rainfall, but it's more Bredesdorp, normally running at about 430 um, you know, season uh, rainfall. And they had uh, last year quite dry um, compared to, it doesn't show that, but there was hot dry spells in between. And he still managed to, to get a 1.982 tonne average. So it wasn't too bad. And that's what his program looked like. So one thing that Barry does is that he factors in every year because of where he is. All these other things go into the mix, but he's always got his Presaro factored in here. And he's working on that's either going to be for blackleg or for sclerotinia. And it just depends on his sowing date and the season. So um, just something to think about there. Um, I got asked to talk about secondary diseases, and it's a bit like Japan and the rugby. Um, Normally it's not an issue, but occasionally they, uh, they do jump up and bite you. So um, white leaf spot and downy mildew are, are very seasonal. Um, and we've seen a bit this year, um, early sowing dates with warm, moist conditions has been more conducive to white leaf spot this year. Last year we had some early sowing dates with not a lot of moisture, but just enough and we saw more downy mildew. So um, for white leaf spot, uh, it's, you know, Again, it's, uh, it's stubble-borne, like blackleg, so uh, tight rotations will favour disease. It's one that often the plant can outgrow, um, but it not always, uh, and it is really all born around, um, around leaf wetness again. So the more rain splash we get, the more spread we get. We've had some limited uh, data, but some indications that application of Prezaro has not so much controlled the, uh, the white leaf spot that was there, but it's enabled the next part of the canopy to maintain being clean, if that makes sense. So then the spot hasn't been able to jump up the canopy. And as those lower leaves that were infected have dropped off through natural senescence, we've seen the disease cycle out of the system. So yeah, it's one that we probably don't fully understand um, in, in Australia. And um, it's probably something for you guys as well to work out a little bit about fungicide strategies um, for this guy. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, it's definitely about rotation again and uh, location to previous stubble. Downy mildew, um, look, same scenario. 
um, although this is a seed and soil borne one. I'm not sure if you guys see it um, too often, but for us it's not normally an issue and sometimes just a uh, protectant spray with copper for a few guys has, has proven effective enough um, to allow the crop to grow away from it. So uh, that's all I've got to cover. So uh, thanks very much for your time and uh, any questions, I guess. I want to ask you about trifluoral in use in, in canola in Oz. Uh, do you use it? And if <coughs> the answer is yes, how? Uh, yes, we use uh, trifluoral and anpropismide extensively. Um, basically, it's a numbers game. So if we can reduce the pressure by using trifluralin and propizamide for our uh, clethodim or our Roundup Ready uh, to work better, um, that's definitely what we're doing. There's very little that would go in without either trifluralin or propizamide. In Western Australia, I would say propizamide's currently more like 70% of the use pattern would be propizamide and the rest would be trifluralin. Uh, we're using it at about two litres, if we're talking trifluralin, um, for two litres per hectare thereabouts and one litre for propizamide. All of that's been done the same way uh, that you're sowing a wheat crop, I guess, at the end of the day. Um, we're using a knife point press wheel system generally, throwing the product out of the row and, uh, and getting, um, you know, getting that safety that way. So um, that's how we're using it, yeah. I'm not sure that fully answers your question, but we just, yeah. I would have liked to have heard you say that uh, some of the guys spray, spray it overall and incorporate before canola. Oh, sorry, yes, it's incorporated by sowing, yeah. So we'll spray, broad, broadcast spray it with a knockdown spray, an insecticide, and then... Yep. Okay, there's another question down there, Pete. Hi, Rick. Um, I want a question on the rolling mall. This is Claritinia thing. It's more a problem in the Southern Cape than in the Swartland, but... Um, According to my observations, is um, there's always early and late infest infestation of the uh, disease. Um, the early infestation, uh, according to what I observed last year, they formed scler sclerosums. The later ones didn't form. Is that okay? So if you spray early uh, on the right, correct stage, you you will start to reduce the number of sclerosums that will form. That's the theory. Yeah. So that's why I say treat it like a weed seed bank. Um, it's really a function of time. So if, if you have lateral branches that have in infected for long enough with good moisture, they'll still produce sclerotes. Um, it's just that those lower primary infections are there for longer um, and therefore able to produce the hard-seeded sclerote um, to carry over. So it's just a function of time, yeah. 